Hi, everyone. Um, I actually have, uh, this is my third session with you all, and I apologize if I do a little bit of a repeat of some of the things that I'd like to tell you about this um, uh, evening. Uh, the collection that we're going to focus on and the importance of it is actually surrounding a person, Samuel Morton. Some of you have been in the sessions before, so you've heard me talk about him. The collection that you see on the table actually comes from the Samuel Morton collection. I'm uh, Janet Monge, curator, associate curator of physical anthropology, so I actually am the person who keeps, maintains, takes care of the collections. And I thought that the Egyptians would be a really good kind of takeoff place for us today in looking at the Morton collection because the uh, Egyptians actually represented for Morton uh, sort of an intermediate population between populations coming from the north and from the um, um, east and populations to the south, the African populations. So Samuel Morton, uh, some of you uh, all already know, of course, was called the father of American physical anthropology. He actually was a f pretty much of a flaming racist and he supported this notion using the physical measurements essentially of crania and the collection. And um, I'm going to go through a little bit, you know, essentially of how and why he did this and hopefully um, add to some information that I've given you on other occasions. Okay. So what do we do with the Morton collection? Well, as with all of our collections in the museum, we have many missions and many things that we attempt to accomplish. Um, our accomplishments are vast, I think, and, and actually and useful in terms of the collection, this collection and other collections. We keep historic collections like the Morton Collection, and the collection is actually actively used today in a variety of different studies looking at human variation. We do have a big CT scan database of the collection, which we distribute to scholars around the world. Uh, in their particular views, they're actually looking for what this variation is, how it's sorted, what it looks like, in an attempt to really understand that variation. We also, of course, have as a directive within the museum something called collection management, and that is that we make sure that we have all of the documentation essentially with the collections. We have the history of each one of the specimens in the collection as best as we can reconstruct this and that uh, we keep the collection basically in a very good state or speed. And that's the preservation part, essentially, of one of our objectives here in the museum. We interpret this in scientific research. Uh, we actually have many scholars who come into the museum to study the collection. Uh, we have probably several hundred of them that come over the course of just a few years. The collection is a vast one, uh, this being just one part of it. We think we have probably uh, something on the order of about maybe 15,000 skeletal people in the collection. So of course, uh, the 1,200 or so in the Morton collection is just a sort of small part of that. The scientific research which is conducted is done by scholars coming from all around the world. We also interpret the collection for the public. We have an exhibit actually that's present on the first floor of the museum if you have a chance. It's actually called Masking and Unmasking Race. And it actually describes this process that Morton had actually gone through to really very much undermine with scientific data this concept of race, which was growing in the United States in the 19th century. It's a 19th century collection. Um, oops, I can't get this to advance. Oh. Uh, the crania are amazing, actually, as a collection, just sitting within the confines of the building. They are... Um, uh, stored, and each one of them you can see is identified with a group of identifiers on the forehead. It actually looks like a relatively simple process, actually, to keep these, you know, in sort and in tow. But the Morton collection is a living collection in the sense that we find out more about it. In some cases, we actually have to alter and change numbers. There's previous numbers on the collection that actually come from previous collectors. Morton himself uh, never collected any specimens at all. He actually had agents, primarily physicians from around the world, actually send him these crania, which became part of this collection. The collection was stored and actually after the death of Morton at the Academy of Natural Sciences, where Morton was actually a pres the president, it was purchased by the Academy and then uh, 
basically gifted to the Penn Museum uh, in the 1990s, but moved to the Penn Museum in the 1960s. So it's been here for quite a long period of time. Just as a detail, a little sort of close up, you can see the kind of markings which are present. Morton produced a catalog of his crania, the 1,200 or so that he had in his lifetime. The collection lived on after his untimely death in 1852 by one of his students, a man by the name of Meigs. So the full collection now is about 2,000 crania or so, so it's really massive. Um, the uh, topical area that I'd like to present today is actually on uh, one of the small subsections, actually, of that collection. It is of the individuals of Egyptian ancestry. Uh, he was fascinated by uh, this uh, group of specimens because, of course, he was trying to understand not only the, you know, sort of the morphology, the features, the physicality, essentially, of the collection, but he also, too, was very interested in documenting the antiquity, essentially, of these features, really documenting the antiquity of race, and that's what he did very effectively and efficiently with the Egyptian section of this collection. So uh, uh, this particular specimen is not in the collections, uh, but I put it here for sort of the recognition of a very famous uh, reconstruction. This is King Tut, and this is the reconstruction which was made of Tut. And of course, you know, this has gone through, you know, many iterations. I'm sure you can understand over the uh, last, well, really 100 years or so, and maybe not 100, but let's say 50 years or so. And the latest and sort of last version is actually shown here. So our collection actually contains, at least at the time of Morton, about 100 specimens or so. Uh, he published this in a major monograph. He produced only really two monographs. This is the second of them published in 1844 called Crania Egypticata. And uh, what he did with the crania, I think you'll find especially interesting. He, as I had already said, is a racist. So I think you can imagine where this is going to go. He actually used his measurements to rank the races. And of course, being a person of European ancestry himself, he ranked Europeans at the top of this hierarchy and people of African ancestry at the very, very bottom. Uh, and he did much kind of sort of interesting maneuvers in order to do this, including exclusion and inclusion of particular specimens to actually achieve that goal. So my goal is actually to have you take a peek uh, at these Egyptian specimens see how he compulsively sort of typed and classified specimens and how he came to the conclusion that the sort of the highest form essentially of these people from Egypt were the royal Egyptians, if you want to think of them that way, the royal Egyptians, and that they um, were the deepest or earliest civilization on the planet known at the time. Uh, not by him specifically, but through many people who took his work and expanded upon it in, in a, even a more racist way, have made the claim that um, because these were the most ancient specimens known and because they actually look like, at least in terms of this morphology, modern Egyptians, they made the statement or the claim that the physicality of race was maintained over the whole history of peoples on the planet. And this was used very strongly in support of polygenesis. That is that a creator made each of these races in this form. They were immutable. They were from the very beginning. And therefore, these were natural categories that needed to be supported. And that there was a natural kind of hierarchy of these peoples and that some you know, within this hierarchy were, in a sense, destined to be you know, the, the people in servitude forever. So it is an insidious kind of a study, and one which you know, really kind of frames a lot of the issues of uh, racism in the, in the 19th century and, in, and also into the 20th century. So what are the measurements? What did he do? How did he do it? Uh, he did, of course, many different types of measurements. The main one we, that we've talked about in our sessions together has to do with brain size. Uh, of course, at the time, the thinking was that brain size was a good sort of reflective of intelligence. Uh, 
So his probably his main sort of classifying unit in this hierarchy was indeed on the components of brain size. But in all honesty, when you go through his work, he was compulsively measuring the specimens uh, with many other um, uh, uh, measurement tools. One of them, of course, and they're written on the sides of the skull, cranial capacity is there, this measure of brain size, but also, too, on the sides of the skull is the angulation of the face. And you can see here that, you know, basically, the shorter the angle, the more ape-like the individuals are. So, of course, he then made a hierarchy essentially going from sort of the most uh, refined face, and that, of course, being the Europeans at 80 degrees, down to the, you know, the ones more ape-like, which were the African populations that he had sampled and performed these measurements on. So, yes, uh, he's called a scientist because he compulsively measures things. He produces the data on it. But, of course, a lot of the suppositions, there's a lot of the, the, the predetermining factors are there that actually can do nothing but lead to this particular outcome. We talked about brain size in, uh, 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 in particular. The crania are only crania in the collection. He did not collect any of the neck down parts of the skeleton. His obsession with this is um, dramatic in terms of his writings. He um, has people who did some of his measurements for him. He threw those out and started all over again, you know, with this incredible sort of uh, obsession to the details of it. Uh, so measurements, cranial capacity and otherwise, were uh, very precisely documented. He was, of course, uh, using the sort of the standard at the time, and the standard even to, you know, in some cases to modern times, of uh, categories of people. Here you're actually looking at this sort of kind of great chunking, essentially, of the, of the, of the um, uh, uh, places on the globe into nine race categories. At the time of Morton, he was dealing only with five race categories. The Egyptians are interesting because he saw them as transitional, essentially, between Europeans, really, and African populations. As uh, Raquel had said so nicely, only a very small fraction of human variation is structured by continents. And so, of course, he then really kind of used this device to really, uh, um, based on the measurements, uh, factor in inclusion into each one of these geographic categories. So we now know, of course, that that kind of variation exists within populations and that recent studies in ancestry basically have shown that individuals and populations have variants which are structured in particular ways, and those are the ones, of course, which form the core, essentially, of many uh, the studies today having to do with ancestry. Uh, the issues that are associated with ancestry still exist in uh, the, really even in the scientific world, primarily within forensics, and you will see many renditions like this one of race categories and actually sort of translated here to sort of skinned out forms of people. So at the top you can see the Caucasoid skull and then of course the Caucasoid person, Mongoloid making a reference to people of Asian origin, and then Negroid making a reference to people of African origins. And these were thought to translate to particular features of the skull. And the features of the skull are listed in great detail in a lot of the forensic anthropological work which is out there today and has been there for a very long time. A person here at Penn by the name of Wilton Krogman was uh, very instrumental in beginning the field of forensic anthropology and he used the Morton collection in a lot of these criteria. Uh, listings like this exist. If you uh, open up any textbook in forensic anthropology, you'll see the basic characteristics which are used to distinguish these continental races from each other and um, are uh, uh, really confounding or difficult to apply to individual case studies, but nevertheless still rear their heads in lots of different uh, kinds of studies. Uh, this is a schema showing the common features of African ancestry in the skull. I have three in a row. The one of European ancestry and the one of Native American ancestry in the United States and the forensic application of this using these very same criteria and measures frequently, at least in this part of the United States, 
it boiled down to seeing differences between these three groups of people. And uh, now, of course, uh, this has expanded with the beginnings, essentially, of um, uh, more complicated renditions of this. Many people, of course, have come to realize that these features are not structured just by great continental masses, but that you can parse these out into smaller units, as this map of Europe is actually showing. It comes from another anthropologist here at Penn, a man by the name of Carlton Kuhn, in the 1950s and 60s, actually took this notion of race and expanded it in several volumes. This one is actually the origin of races. And you can see that rather than just sort of Europe, he's got it broken down into individual populations within Europe, and then looked at the various components, essentially, of the skull associated with each of these regional populations. And that, of course, um, leads essentially to really a 21st century version of the use of these characteristics. Again, this is primarily in a forensic context, and that is of a um, program which is actually called 4DISC, and I've talked about this before in our sessions together. And 4DISC is actually a discriminant function analysis program that actually looks at uh, a variety of measurements of the crania. You can see, you know, basically a lot of points and, you know, lines and things like this that are drawn between these different points. And then, of course, the name and the, uh, of each one of these measurements and each one of these points. And taking tons of those measurements, of course, we, be then, we then are able to look at variation in human populations. Each one of these circles actually represents a particular population and I think aptly illustrates, I think, the most key feature, and that is that human populations are as, you know, everything and reinforced, you know, pretty much every day in every way, uh, show uh, much overlap. I mean, uh, it's like an astounding amount of overlap in uh, features associated with morphology. And indeed, I mean, I think that it's almost overwhelming looking at this, how difficult it would be based on very sophisticated measurements and very, statistical, uh, very sophisticated statistical analysis to say that a person came from one or another population. So all of these attempts, you know, really have come to the end that in the phenotype associated with the morphology of the cranium, it's very difficult to distinguish humans from each other by race categories, even by sex, actually. So I'll do a little vignette here on Crania aegypticata, and it actually was published in 1844. Uh, his work on the Egyptian crania is really remarkable. I, uh, I would direct your attention to it, but it just kind of goes on and on and on with these descriptions of this skull and of that skull and the conclusions that he comes to that the Egyptians, you know, essentially are at the crossroads between these different continental masses and that they show features of all different kinds of populations, which of course he parses out and, say, and says migrated into Egypt and therefore are not indigenous peoples in that area. And then of course coming to the conclusion at the end that especially because of its relationship to really what are usually considered sub-Saharan populations, like the Nubians, are much superior to them, as you can imagine. So it's quite an interesting sort of revelation to go through his work and to see how he uh, comes to the conclusions that he does. So of course the cover page and then the first page of the volume, it's dedicated to a man by the name of George Glidden, who took Morton's work and developed it into really a public classroom for, for I, I can't think of a better way to say it. He traveled around the United States and gave lectures on the superiority basically of Europeans. He really solidified in the public mind this idea of race and the superiority of particular races. So Morton, more of a kind of a bookie, kind of a scientist, uh, never went into that kind of realm. So he uh, really, uh, in supporting these other scholars, really brought, you know, essentially to the fore a lot of this thinking, and that is probably one of the great tragedies, essentially, of this uh, work of Samuel Morton. This is actually a group of um, uh, drawings which were made of some of the skulls that he collected from the catacombs of Thebes. Uh, 
I will also just you know show a couple of these on the slide so you can actually pick them out on the on the on the and at the front of the or at the base of the stage in case you're really sort of interested in looking at the kind of variation which is present. In all honesty, I think you're going to be overwhelmed by the amount of variation which is present in these crania. And so of course, you know, it is the common notion now that variation is broad within these geographic populations. And that should be really the center focus of studies from this point onward. When he had these original 100 specimens or so, he divided them into these nice sort of categories. Pelagic actually means a person. It's making a reference essentially to a person who comes from Greece, so this would be a European form. Semitic, of course, is a reference oftentimes to languages which are present primarily in the Middle East, the Egyptian form, Negroid form, and then Negro. And that is, of course, the groupings that he has within the sample that move more towards the measurements that are associated with sub-Saharan populations. And you can see down the side that uh, there is a brain size which is associated with each one of these uh, forms. And that at the top, of course, again, we're ranking the Europeans. And that at the bottom, it's only one specimen. There are many other specimens in the, in the collection that are from sub-Saharan Africa, which, of course, he, you know, calculates a broader meat on that actually are at the low end of this rung of this hierarchy. The measurements are compulsive, as I had said. You can see that he goes through frontal diameter, parietal diameter, vertical di diameter, all of these kinds of measurements in order to uh, come to a conclusion on how to classify the crania. He, of course, uh, puts this together in Crania Egypticata, which is actually observations on Egyptian ethnography. He puts together information from culture, as well as from these biological features of the crania, and melds them into the story, essentially, of the antiquity of the Egyptians as a kind of a pure race in this interspace, essentially, between the continents. And he very much, um, uh, pushes down or demeans the uh, great culture, basically, also to of Egypt and of Sudan, the Nubians. So he has many discussions, and they're basically supporting his idea of the inferiority of peoples of African ancestry by coming to the conclusion that the Egyptians are the first. Uh, um, and, and essentially the, the founding culture, essentially, of the African continent, and that the Nubians were the sort of secondary, the almost, the, I don't know, the imitators, essentially, of the great Egyptian culture. So uh, he you know, makes a reference in his work, uh, essentially, to people who have dark skin and are of dark form. He recognizes and understands the distribution, essentially, of the different peoples which are present in the Egyptian sample. And he comes to the conclusion that, um, as is sort of predetermined or predictated, that uh, African populations are destined, basically, to live in servitude because of the inferiority, essentially, to which they were created. So I feel like I'm in a little bit of a negative sense and on a negative note. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I think I absolutely am. I mean, uh, the fact that the Morton Collection sort of drives you in that kind of direction. I really uh, mostly wanted to give you a sense of uh, how the collection had been really used in the past and how it did frame the scientific basis of racism and how we especially used the Egyptian sample in a very, very, very special way. So in any event, I'm open to some questions if you know anybody would like to come forward and, and ask if I can answer them or direct you to the panel. So to the mic. <laughs> I think I just bored you to death. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Hello. Um, what are the practical uh, implications of uh, genetics and race that are uh, relative to this present moment? Uh, it seems to me that um, we can't really talk about genetics and race without talking about racism. Uh, and it seems to me, according to the map, mm -hmm. that the politics of race, particularly in America, and, and in fact all over the world, that people of color mm 
uh, have been subjugated probably because of the small minority of whites. I think <laughs> when whites, males in particular, came out of Europe from when they had changed, when they went from African to white, based on uh, adaptation, um, um, what's the other word, um, albinism, perhaps, uh, that they realized that they could not produce uh, anything of color, and that if the so-called races were to come together, that whites would be genetically annihilated. <laughs> Um, is that in fact the case and has that permeated um, to this day where you have black males in vast numbers in prison because we're the ones that make the babies. We're the threat because we genetically, you know, you have the, uh, what's the, how you break it down with the, um, the gene, we have the dominant and the recessive, uh, white being recessive, black, and even I am not an, an African, mm -hmm. I'm a product of mm -hmm. many mixtures, mm -hmm. as we all are in this room. Mm -hmm. So what can we do to, to change that racism? Or will it always be prevalent with privilege for whites and um, you know, uh, lesser so-called folk, people of color, always subjected to uh, lesser things in life and, and opportunities because if you are afraid that you are going to be genetically annihilated, you have to maintain power. <laughs> Prisons, courts, mm -hmm. institutions, mm -hmm. even this beautiful institution, they're mm -hmm. mainly Asians and whites. Mm -hmm. In the medical schools, mm -hmm. they're Asians, whites. Because mm -hmm. um, the mixture is not a threat. Mm -hmm. But with the African, as we see what's going on, and I'm gonna stop because <laughs> as you see, I could go on and on. No, I mean, so I absolutely, I, I understand the, you know, the, the sentiment in your very complicated question. I, I, I wish I could answer that adequately. It has so many amazing tentacles to it. And I, I'm actually sure that I can't answer it, to be honest. I mean, I think that your observations are, you know, um, uh, accurate in many respects. It's just that it is difficult to you know, sort of par parse out the many components, basically, of your question for me, you know, basically to address them, including ones that I feel as if I'm not an expert in, for example, a lot of the social issues that are involved in race and racism. Uh, so I would almost, you know, I, I don't mean this as a cop-out, I would say that there is, you know, the, the singular myth that's out there that we're different from each other. I mean, I think that that's the basis of much of these kinds of discussions, that there is something significantly different okay, between human populations, and that it's sorted into these categories called race. And that, uh, you know, once you sort of start there, you actually sort of back yourself into this idea that you know you have this race and that race you've made you know in a sense the other. So what I'm you know oftentimes saying, and I think for me probably the most powerful way to think about it is that we're all really just little teeny variations on being African people, and that you know to sort of emphasize those little teeny variations is is not super productive especially in the way it plays out in a variety of different social ways as you're making a reference to. So I'm positive I'm not adequately answering your question and for that I do apologize. I would absolutely say to come forward and ask the panelists today if they can you know, express their viewpoints on this. I don't think that, um, I don't think that we can uh, sort of dissolve a lot of the a lot of the conflicts that we see associated with race to sort of a, a singular objective. I think that you know people probably come at this in a variety of different ways, and I think that there are some components which are associated with fear and threat and the other, uh, and that's absolutely playing into it as you were saying. But I absolutely think, as you made reference to yourself, that we're all this composite person and that we choose to identify ourselves in one or another pot because it suits you know, particular kinds of 
um, uh, social issues or cultural issues. So if we could get rid of, you know, essentially that really, I think, basic falsehood that we're so different from each other, I think that we could, you know, sort of move a bit better. I mean, it's naive of me to say this, but I think it would be a better way, actually, to move forward and to be more realistic in addressing our commonalities and not overemphasizing our differences from each other. So again, I say I, I don't think I adequately address the tentacles of your, of your excellent question, but yeah, hopefully the panelists will be able to pop in and give you some more information. Thank you, thank you. Hello. Yes. Hi. Oh, oh yes. Hi. Uh, thank you and to Raquel for uh, both very fascinating presentations. Uh, my question pertains to Mr. Morton, who was obviously a product of his time, which was itself steeped in very vile and contemptible ideas. Um, and also, in sort of a sense, being a scientist, he almost came to his theories in a backward mm -hmm. sense, trying to sort of prove what he already believed. Mm -hmm. um, but wasn't he using sort of racial categories to explain what were necessarily cultural and technological differences? Uh, listening to your remarks and to Raquel's remarks, I was mm. sort of thinking back to guns, germs, and steel, which mm. are not necessarily racial differences, but mainly cultural and technological mm -hmm. differences. And if that's the case, could you provide perhaps some more reading material for us to sort of explore those ideas in deeper detail? I mean, absolutely, and in fact, if I can you know, take a good lead on that and ask my colleagues in the room to I'll allow me to enter and go into the website and actually, you know, put forward many, there's many actually excellent writings on this. Our first session was actually on the history of the race concept in the United States. And uh, I'd be more than happy actually to make some contributions to the reading core on that score. Uh, in terms of, you know, uh, Morton, the, the, you know, the thing is that if you, you know, basically want to define an entity in a particular way, uh, you can do it by skin color if you so choose to do it. In Morton's case, he's, you know, using other measurement criteria, including brain size. You can absolutely do that because you can create that core, essentially, of those whatevers. It could be ants, it could be bees, it could be anything. You can create that core and then, you know, really come to, you know, solidify the notion of what's represented in that core. The problem is that if you're really kind of honestly doing this, you're going to see that there are things that don't revolve around that core. Uh, there is no recognition, essentially, in Morton's work that there is variation. So when he sees variation, he sees them as mixed people or other people, or he puts them into other categories. And absolutely, you can do that. And many people uh, still do that. And it is this kind of what we would call typological thinking, which has been so key and essential in a lot of the discussions that are associated with race. So it's like you have a blinder, and you're going to just see these particular features and then just you know just really kind of throw out everything that's messy on the outside and he was very effective at doing that and uh, you can see that he really enlisted the help of many you know really uh, you know sort of syncophant pupils in this endeavor because at its core he was just you know reinforcing uh, this racial idea or understanding of his time, and that's, of course, why it was so effective. But absolutely, we'll put some readings up for you. I don't know that I answered again your full question, <laughs> which had many parts to it, too. It's okay. One more? Okay. Uh, hi, Dr. Miles. Good to see you again. Good to see you. Um, my question is also related to um, Dr. Morton. So you mentioned that he studied um, Egypt. Did he understand exactly how old that civilization was? And if so, um, being a scientist, did he compare the antiquity of Egyptian civilization to what was going on in Europe at the time of the uh, Pharaonic dynasties? And if so, well, I guess the fact that, um, as she said, um, he had a conclusion, he just gathered information to support his conclusion. Mm -hmm. But um, I guess my basic question is, did he write anything about what was going on in Egypt with these um, um, 
the Egyptian civilization that dates back to what, 3500 BC, I think? They were even older in some, yeah. Yeah, and compared to 3500 BC in whatever part of Europe he wanted or the to rest focus of the world. on. Right, yeah. He had really no sense of time, actually. Then I think that. I mean, I think that he understood the ancientness, essentially, of the pyramids, because a lot of these materials actually derive from pyramids. Uh, in terms of, you know, putting a date on it, uh, there is really kind of no sense of how deep in time that is. He full well recognized that this was, and he's an interesting guy, a great civilization, and he understood its depth, that it was much deeper uh, than things that had at least yielded crania that he could study that had been found in Europe. I'm sure they knew, you know, all of the, uh, you know, people who made a lot of the um, megaliths and things like this. He understood that there was this deep history in Europe. But in terms of being able to study it in the same way, that possibility didn't exist. So uh, he then, of course, made an assumption that this is, uh, well, I mean, I don't think that he denied the fact that you could have a time depth, you know, essentially to European ancestry either. He just couldn't deal with it in those terms. But for him, these were absolutely at the deepest core of what was understood about human populations. He says he leaves it up to archaeologists basically to see the time frame difference, for example, between the uh, uh, Egyptian uh, productions and the Nubian productions. And he comes to his conclusion that basically the Egyptians are older, but it's not based on any sort of factual information. And he doesn't actually expend the same amount of time in talking about European populations as he does, for example, in the Americas and in Egypt. Those are his two sort of key geographic places and, and expending a lot of his energy. So thank you. Yeah. So, okay. And uh, we can take a break now. Yeah. Yes. At the table. So uh, actually, Kate is reminding me that we're going to take a 15-minute break, but we're not really going to give you a break because that's just not the nature of the beast. We'd like you to come forward and actually look at the crania, which are present if you so choose to do so. Me and two of my excellent students are actually going to be manning the tables. So if you would like to come and ask us any questions about the crania, we're happy to take those questions and then come back or reconvene in 15 minutes, and the panelists will actually take their position and hopefully answer these great questions much better than I actually did. 